So uh, that's it. Uh, very less amount of participants today. All right. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, last session, we stopped with the Calvarium and uh, uh, I told you that we have a few more uh, to go into detail, like post natal growth of the Calvarium and things like that. Okay. Um, any more joining? Reem, uh, Ragad, Naif, Muhammad Ayad, and Ahmed here. Anyone else joining? Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, what's a calvarium? The calvarium, as I mentioned in the last class, it means the upper part of your skull. Okay. Your head is divided into two parts. The upper part of your skull is called the calvarium. The lower part where the brain rests is called your cranial base. Okay, now what is calvarium? It's a part of the skull that develops intramembranous. So calvarium is formed by intramembranous bone formation. If you remember, I told you there are two types of bone formation, uh, intramembranous and endochondral. So calvarium is intramembranous. And therefore, it will follow more of neural growth pattern. That's with the growth of the brain. Okay, it comprises of the frontal bones, the parietal bones, it's commerce part of the temporal and occipital bones. And ossification centers for each bone appears in the outer membrane uh, surrounding the brain during the eighth week of IV. So bone formation spreads uh, by osteogenic uh, forms of adjacent bones where they meet and sutures are formed. So in between your frontal, parietal, squamous, temporal, occipital, you will find sutures. Okay, and these are bone growth sites. So where more than two bones meet, the intersection between the sutures are occupied by a large membrane called the fontanelles. Now, if you see in young children, you'll note that the, the upper portion of the head and side portion of the head, back portion of the head are soft areas. Now, these soft areas are called fontanelles, okay, which disappears as the child grows. So what's the function of these fontanelles? The main function of the fontanelle is, is to help during childbirth. Why? These fontanelles act as shock absorbers, preventing any damage to the brain. Okay, so these fontanelles are important for compression of the head when it passes through the birth canal. There are six fontanelles and they close by 18 months. By the age of six months, the calvarium has developed and the inner and outer cortical tables have been formed. So uh, its growth consists of a combination of displacement due to expanding brain. So as the brain grows outwards, the calvarium also grows outwards. Okay, and osteogenesis at the sutural margin. So at the sutures also there is growth. So two ways in which the calvarium grows with the expanding brain, growth of the brain, and uh, at the sutural margins. And the remodeling of the surface increases the thickness and the change in shape. Okay, uh, These are the fontanelles, the anterior fontanelle, posterior, the sphenoid and mastoid fontanelle. Okay, that's all about your cranial base. Now coming, sorry, uh, of your calvarium, now coming to your cranial base. How, what is cranial base and how is it formed? Okay, the cranial base is developed by endochondral ossification. So the calvarium, the top of the head, where the uh, you know it covers the upper portion of the brain, is cover, it's, it's by intramembranous growth formation or bone formation. And the cranial base where the brain rests is by endochondral ossification. So growth of the cranial base is influenced by both neural, that's growth of the brain, and somatic growth patterns, that's the growth of the rest of the part of the body. With 50% of the postnatal growth being complete by age of three years. So as in the calvarium, there is both remodeling and sutural filling as the brain enlarges. But there are also primary cartilaginous growth sites in this region and they are called synchondrosis. Now if you remember, I mentioned about synchondrosis process which is like a sandwich bit like a like a sandwich like um, a piece of uh, cartilage between two bones okay and this piece of cartilage is sandwiched between the two bones if you remember the last lectures 
I mentioned about uh, this synchondrosis. Okay, and this synchondrosis is one of the primary cartilaginous growth sites, which is responsible for the growth of your cranial base along with your remodeling and sutural filling as the brain enlarges. So of these, this pheno-occipital synchondrosis is one of the most important synchondrosis because all the other synchondrosis, they close at an early stage except for the sphenooccipital synchondrosis okay and the growth of the sphenooccipital synchondrosis continues up to 13 to 15 years in females and 15 to 17 years in males so this is a very important point about this sphenooccipital synchondrosis because it helps in growth of your cranial base so uh, if you remember this picture that's what i showed you uh, in the last class, we have the sphenoethymoid synchondrosis, intersphenoid, and sphenooccipital synchondrosis. Okay, now if you look at the cranial base, you will see the cranial base. If you take the brain out, you will see that there are a lot of depressions and you know elevations in the cranial uh, in the cranial base in the skull, inside the skull. Okay, and we can divide this into three parts. The middle cranial fossa, the anterior, and the posterior cranial fossa. Okay, of which the middle cranial fossa and the anterior cranial fossa is kind of very important to us. Okay, so why is it so? The middle cranial fossa follows a somatic pattern of growth because it's in the middle region and near to the rest of the body. The anterior cranial fossa follows a neural pattern of growth because it's away from the uh, uh, rest of the body and move towards your calvarium and your upper portion of your brain. So that's more of neural growth pattern. So the middle cranial fossa follows a somatic pattern and enlarges both by anterior posterior growth of the controls and by remodeling. The anterior cranial fossa follows a neural pattern and enlarges and increases in the anterior posterior length by remodeling. Okay, there is no sphenoid and controls act anterior cranial fossa with resorption intracranially and corresponding extracranial deposition. So it takes place. Inside, there'll be resorption. Outside, there'll be deposition of the bone. There is no further growth of the anterior cranial fossa by the age of seven. So anterior cranial fossa stops by the age of seven. The spinosal synchondrosis is anterior to the TMJ, but posterior to the anterior cranial fossa. And therefore, its growth is significantly, its, its growth is significant clinically as it influences the overall facial skeletal pattern complex. Now, with the spinosal synchondrosis, with the push of the cranial base, you will see that when the maxilla is displaced, if you remember, I told you in the last class, there is something called as displacement and drift. Okay, drift is because of the bone growth at the suture level of the bone itself. Okay, and displacement is because the bone is being displaced because of growth of the adjacent bone. Okay, it's like someone is sitting uh, next to you. Okay, and if you push that person, that person gets displaced. So in the same way, the maxilla gets displaced when the cranial base grows. Now, the person you know, pushing against you and moving is like drift because he or she is using his own force to move with the help of the other bones. So it's like your growth at the sutures. Okay, coming to your maxillary complex. So the calvarium and the cranial base is over. Now coming to your maxillary complex, your maxilla. Maxilla is the third bone to ossify after the clavicle and the mandible. So the first bone to ossify is the clavicle, the second one is the mandible, the third one is your maxilla. Now, postnatal growth of the maxilla follows a growth pattern that is thought to be intermediate between your neural and somatic pattern of growth. Why? Because if you look at it, the maxilla is attached to the skull, okay, and it's more towards the upper portion of the skull. So it's more near to the anterior cranial fossa. But uh, it is not completely on the anterior cranial fossa because there is some part of it which is attached to your middle cranial fossa as well because your synchondros is pushing or enlarging will also push the mandible or displace the mandible in a forward and downward direction, okay. So it is intermediate between. This intermediate means it's in between your neural and your somatic growth pattern. So growth of the maxillary complex occurs by part. 
by displacement one okay with fill in growth at the sutures and in part by drift and periosteal remodeling okay so displacement drift and remodeling are the three main ways which the maxilla grows now always remember all bones like maxilla and mandible okay they grow in the in an upward and backward direction okay but when they grow in an upward and backward direction they move in a forward and downward pattern or downward direction so always you know people get confused whenever you ask the person how does the maxilla grow they say forward and downwards that's wrong because forward and downwards is the way it moves okay the growth is actually upwards and backwards same for the mandible it's upwards and backwards but the movement is forwards and downwards because of the upward and backward growth pattern okay so passive forward displacement is important up to the age of 7 due to the effects of growth of the cranial base very simple we just learned about that as i told you the cranial base uh, growth pushes the or displaces the maxilla in a forward direction and downward direction okay when the neural growth is complete the maxilla growth slows and subsequently one third of the growth is due to displacement that is 0.2 to 1 mm per year with the remainder by sutural growth that is 1 to 2 mm per year in total up to 10 mm of bone is added by growth at the sutures so, so there is more amount of sutural growth than more amount of displacement taking place okay so primarily more growth takes place by sutural filling by displacement of so much of the anterior posterior growth of the maxilla I'm sorry, I went offline for a minute. I'm back. Yeah. So the growth of the tuberosities help in erosion of the tooth as well. Okay. A forward displacement of the maxilla gives room for the deposition of the bone at the tuberosities. So when the maxilla is displaced in a forward direction, there is enough space created so that there can be bone deposition at the tuberosities, which help again in the growth of the maxilla in the upward and backward direction and the tuberosities. in 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 turn helping in the eruption of your teeth okay so yeah if you see this person pulling the cart if you see this person pulling the cart you'll see the direction of growth the guy who is moving forward is a direction of growth okay that's how the growth takes place and how does it if if you see the mandible moving forward and downward or backward so forward and downward or the maxilla moving forward and downward okay remember that the back end is being filled by bone and the anterior end is being remodeled okay bone resorption takes place whereas the bone deposition takes place in the posterior as the growth direction so forward and downward movement of the Uh, maxilla or the mandible there will be bone deposition at the posterior part so the growth is actually in an upward and backward direction with forward and downward movement of the maxilla and the mandible all right now we come to growth of your mandible i just uh, yeah we missed something growth of your palate okay growth of your palate so again in the same way i told you uh, the movement occurs in a forward and downward pattern and growth occurs in a backward pattern so palate that is the palate remodels downwards on its inferior surface and resorption at it superior surface so inside part is deposited and the superior surface
you know they exactly like they, they think there is something wrong with the black board something wrong with the black board. i hope you can still hear me okay so maxillary sorry the lateral expansion of the face is due to the mid deposition remodeling due to enlargement of your air sciences so maxillary growth slows to an adult level on an average about 15 years in girls and 17 years in boys so there is growth occurring even at okay i'm still connected but there's something wrong with that's going up and on okay so in girls it stops by 15 years by 17 years the same thing we saw uh, if you look at the growth of your your uh, calvarium or cranial base okay i i told you it stops by 13 to 15 in uh, girls and just a sec yeah 13 to 15 in girls and 15 to 17 in boys here so the same pattern is for the maxilla it stops by 15 in girls and by 17 in boys uh, uh, lecture so how does the mandible grow i told you the first bone to ossify is your uh, clavicle the second uh, to ossify after the clavicle is your mandible and the third bone is your max so mandible derives from the pharyngeal first pharyngeal arch and ossifies intramembranously at the beginning of the sixth week of IU intrauterine life okay it is a second bone to ossify after your clavicle so clavicle first mandible second and maxilla the third bone what happens now most of the people uh, think that um, the mandible is formed by uh, you know remnants of a cartilage it is not so because mandible is formed by intramembranous bone formation it is never formed by a cartilage okay so everyone has a misunderstanding that the mandible is formed by the cartilage no it is not it is purely intramembranous bone formation now when i say the mandible which grows postnatally i am referring to only the ramus and the body of the mandible the condyle the coronoid and the chin are formed by endochondral bone formation they are parts which attach to the mandible after the mandible has formed the body and the ramus have been formed so if you ask the mandible growth if anyone asks you it is intramembranous and only the ramus and the body are existent at that particular point you know point of time and the condyle the coronoid and the chin are endochondral bone formation uh, bones which attach to the mandible at a later period okay after the mandible has been formed so, so that everyone says uh, you know is uh, is responsible for the formation of mandible is nothing but the meckel's cartilage now many of them misunderstand that the meckel's cartilage uh, you know helps in the mandibular formation no it is not so okay what the meckel's cartilage is existent there is that the trigeminal nerve goes around this cartilage or in the pathway of this cartilage so it guides the mandibular growth it does not have any function with formation of the mandible so don't get confused if any questions are asked and they ask you is the meckel's cartilage responsible for mandible you just immediately say no it is not there is no uh, no evidence that meckel's cartilage is responsible for mandible growth because meckel's cartilage is the cartilage and ma mandible is formed purely by intramembranous bone formation. So that will clear your hands off. So the first structure to develop in the primordial of the lower jaw is the mandible division of the trigeminal nerve, which precedes mesenchymal condensation forming the secondary cartilages appear, uh, including condylar cartilage during the 10th week of IU. So the first thing that you see is primary ossification centers around your trigeminal nerve which is the first to form okay in the uh, formation of the mandible and around this nerve is the ossification that takes place and because this nerve follows that you know l-shaped pattern that your mandible has a l-shaped pattern 
okay it is nothing to do with the meckel's cartilage meckel's cartilage may just guide the nerve and the formation of the mandible in that shape but it's nothing to do with the as such with the growth of the mandible so endochondral bones appear in condylar cartilage the coronoid and the chin okay by around 14 week i you both inferior and superior joint spaces have appeared by the left week and by 22 22nd week of i you the glenular fossa and the articular eminence have been formed so almost everything is completed by around 22nd week okay by 14th week you have the condylar cartilage the inferior and superior joint spaces by the 11th week and by 22nd week you have glenular fossa and articular eminence so your tmj and everything is getting formed there condyle and coronoid if it's not intramembrane as well it's a part of the mandible so we have to mention it here so there's no other code okay so postnatal growth of the mandible follows a pattern intermediate between neural and somatic now you'll ask me why doctor you're saying intermediate between neural and somatic because uh, to an extent if you see the condyle it is attached to the cranial base area is it not the, the tmj right and the maxilla is sitting right on top of the mandible so some effect on the maxilla will have some effect on the mandible some effect on the cranial base will have some effect on the mandible is it not so that is why again we say it's an intermediate pattern between the neural and somatic with more of somatic growth pattern and less of neural growth pattern so most mandible growth occurs as a result of periosteal activity so most of the growth of your mandible is by pure periosteal activity muscular processes develop the, the angles in the mandible and coronoid process and the alveolar process develop vertically to keep in pace with the eruption so once the muscles are attached you know uh, it helps in further growth of the mandible the, the muscle pull is also there we, we are coming to that theory it's called functional matrix theory i'll come to that theory next okay uh, as a diagrammatic representation of the initial bone formation which i told you which takes place around your meckel's cartilage and it is not uh, the meckel's cartilage itself is not responsible that's your meckel's cartilage and that is your trigeminal nerve okay and this nerve is the reason why you have this primary ossification center that forms around this nerve okay and that forms the content this meckel's cartilage disappears after some period of time and the mandible takes the shape because of the uh the the path of the trigeminal nerve which is along the meckel's cartilage okay the condylar cartilage you if you see here it's a secondary cartilage which comes and attaches and then forms your condylar head there same for the coronoid and same for the chin okay so condylar cartilage develops initially as a separate area of condensation from that of the body of the mandible and only later it's incorporated within separate areas of mesial condensation at 8th week fusion of the cartilage with the mandibular body at the 4th month and it is there at birth when you look at it so as the mandible is displaced forwards that's because of the growth of the condylar cartilage uh, and there is filling at the condylar cartilage posteriorly so because of there is growth of the condylar cartilage the mandible gets displaced forwards and downwards at the same time you have when it moves forwards and downwards you have periosteal remodeling taking place okay which maintains the shape now if you remember i showed you that picture of a guy pulling the cart as the guy goes forward there is a resorption in the anti region and deposition in the posterior region so as the mandible moves forwards and downwards you will see that there is a resorption and deposition in the posterior region so the ramus and the condyle there is maximum taking place as the mandible and forwards but when you say you say the maxilla both grow in an upward and backward direction when it's displaced in a forward and downward direction so bone is laid down on the posterior margin of the vertical ramus and resorbed on the anterior margin and this posterior drift of the ramus allows for lengthening of your dental arches posteriorly just like your tuberosity area for the, uh, the maxilla similarly the thing functions when the ramus is growing in a backward direction there there is enough uh, room for lengthening of the dental arch posterior so remodeling brings about increase in width of the mandible particularly posteriorly lengthening of the mandible and according to the causes
in males it is more prominent if you ask me why it is i do not have an answer for that because uh, that's that's there again yeah i'm getting cut and i'm coming back again yeah mandibular growth slows to adult level rather than the maxillary growth on an average at 17 years in girls and 19 years in boys so just think uh let's start from the same contrast 13 to 15 in girls okay 15 to 17 in boys okay then uh, 15 the maxilla stops growing in girls 17 the maxilla stops growing in boys 17 the mandible stops growing in girls and 19 the mandible stops growing in boys so if you remember the sequence of what is taking place you will get much easier to understand how each bone grows the cranial base and the cranial vault or the calvarium grows with the growth of the brain and uh, especially the calvarium with the growth of the brain the cranial base with growth of the brain as well as your sinkhorn rosa's growth okay now this is a diagnostic representation of how the mandible grows the growth of the mandible is viewed from this perspective okay of a stable cranial base the chin moves downwards and forwards mandibular growth while there is exceptional growth and remodeling of the ramus moving it posteriorly that's why you see this arrows and the direction of the arrows in a backward and upward direction okay if you look at this picture in the next uh, slide here if you look at this picture here you will see that the mandible has grown in a backward and upward direction at the same time it has moved in a forward and downward direction and that is why when it's moved you will see this sign minus and this side plus so the movement of the mandible in this direction like the guy pulling the cart okay forward there is a resorption and back concept of the mandible that the man that's about with the the maxilla Okay, am I? Yeah, I'm back online. Okay. When I talk about growth rotations, always remember the move of your, you know, of your uh, is your mandible. Okay, I'm back again. So when I say about growth rotations, remember that it is more towards the uh, mandible than maxilla because the maxilla is attached, and you cannot appreciate the growth rotation of maxilla, but you can appreciate the growth rotation of your mandible because it's a movable joint. Okay, the growth rotation is most obvious, and they have the highest impact on the mandible, and the effect on the maxilla is small because it is attached and is masked by remodeling. So forward growth rotation. are far more common than backward rotation with the average being a mild forward produces a well balanced facial appearance now what happens if there is more forward rotation or more backward rotation let's say there is more forward rotation or a marked or a forward rotation certain reduced anterior cervical facial proportion now what does this mean by anterior facial proportion that means see, if this is your mandible okay and if there is more 
sorry, if there is more of rotation in this direction, okay, that means the facial height is decreased, okay, and vice versa. If the mandible rotates more in a downward direction, the face becomes elongated. So, anterior facial proportion decreases in forward rotation, and there is a chance of increased overbite or deep bite. A backward rotation will tend to increase your facial height. Anterior facial height is increased, and the overbite or uh, is reduced, or you end up with an anterior open bite. Now, how to explain that? I'll explain that with this picture here. The first picture is a short face, and this is a short face. See, because the mandible has more of you know upward rotation. Okay, more of upward rotation. And here in the second picture, you will see a long face because more of backward rotation of your mandible. Now, what happens with forward rotation? You have deep bite. What happens with backward rotation? You have open bite. Okay. Now, it is not seen in all the cases, but most of the cases, this is the scenario. All right. All right. Now, coming to the last part of this, control of cranial facial. So, what is exactly that? Is the reason for all these growth? So one is the genetic theory. They say genes are responsible and Hox genes are the ones which play a major role in controlling craniofacial growth. Functional matrix theory is another theory which states that soft tissue growth is responsible for hard tissue growth. For example, the growth of the influences the growth of your upper portion of your skull. Okay. Muscles of mastication attached to the max on the mandible help in growth of your mandible because of the muscular that means soft tissue pulls and the heart tissue. Functional appliance, whether you do fixed orthodontic treatment, whether you do removable orthodontic treatment. So, growth prediction is very important. So, how do you know what or what age is the patient in to? Uh, start all these treatments. Now, for this, we need some x rays, hand wrist x ray. You take the hand and take the hand wrist and put it on the x ray machine and take the x ray. So, you will see different bones in this hand which grows at different periods or different years. The patient is say 15 years, 11 years, 12 years. Okay. The same for the vertebrae. The cervical vertebrae also shows different shapes. Like you will see from a rectangular shape, which is like a box, to a more elongated rectangle when the patient grows older. Cervical vertebrae also helps in uh, growth prediction. Eruption of the canine. Now we all know that canine erupts at this particular age, boys and girls. So it is easy to grow, uh, predict the growth of the canine. But nowadays we don't follow the canine because uh, eruption patterns have changed with uh, you know people mature, the females and the males maturing at a faster rate than what used to be 10 15 years back so uh, we have uh, mainly stuck on to cervical vertebrae and andrus x-rays for predicting growth all right with this we end your lecture in growth and development as i told you uh, i have finished it a half an hour and a few minutes extra sorry about that uh, you have any doubt regarding this? I know the, this is a very difficult lecture, growth and development, and it's not an easy lecture to do uh, or learn. But uh, unfortunately, uh, growth and development is very important, and we have no this, no escape on this. It's, you have to read it. Uh, try to understand. Okay, so that's about it for the lecture today. I uh, hope you understood something. And any doubts, please feel free to ask me in your sessions. And see you.